Welcome to day nine of your 30-day dental MBA. And day eight, we were talking about the ultimate family practice receptionist. And today we're going to talk about the hygienist. Of course, we always like to bleed over a little from day eight into day nine to keep you hanging. And <clears throat> the one thing that everyone needs to pay attention to the most, and I kind of want to say this somewhere between the receptionist and the hygienist, the assistant tape, and that is about people gladly pay more for service. Look at the prices people pay at a convenience store simply because they don't want to use a grocery store. People gladly pay for Federal Express instead of using the post office. People gladly pay more for a nonstop flight instead of having a layover. Every day people pay $100 more for a crown a day simply because they couldn't get them in for three days. This is the cardinal sin of hygiene. They call up today for a cleaning. The hygienist thinks she's supposed to be booked two, three weeks in advance. And if she has a cancellation, she calls it a, a no-show or a cancellation or a reschedule. She's upset. Yet I've never walked into a restaurant in my life that didn't have a half dozen empty tables. It's not called a cancellation or no-show. It's simply called having capacity. The number one problem in dentistry today is that dentists still do not clearly explain in written detail the expected expense before the treatment is started. We still have tens of thousands of dentists named Dr. Ambiguous saying, don't worry about the fee, we'll work it out. Not discussing fees before treatment is a human relations crime. I think most of it comes from just fear of confrontation or, uh, con or, or Greg Stanley here in Scottsdale calls it confrontational tolerance. But you have to be able to sit down with every person. Um, you can do it in the operatory. It doesn't matter. You can have a special room like we do here sometimes. It doesn't matter. But confrontational interfaces test your confrontational tolerance. You have to talk fees. Remember at McDonald's, they take the order for a hamburger. They take the money for the hamburger. Then they give you the hamburger. Dentistry's backwards. They take the order for the hamburger. They give you the hamburger. You usually go home and eat it. And a month later, get a bill. Less than 2% of all family practicing dentists collect no money from private insurance companies. This is, sounds like a bizarre statistic considering almost every practice management seminar I go to, I, the, all they talk about is how um, don't get in bed with the insurance companies, uh, don't accept their money, uh, go insurance free. And once again, it's that phenomenon where 98% of the dentists are daydreaming about the top 2%, but 98% of dentists collect money from insurance companies. Less than 3% of all specialists collect no money from private insurance companies. 60% um, of all dentists accept no money from the government, but that's simply because Medicaid and Medicare, in most states, uh, Medicaid, the state branch of the federal plan of Medicare, Medicaid in most states does not accept or, or cover dental procedures. But we still have a, a huge portion of dental finance covered by insurance companies. Um, in 1997, uh, Indemnity Dental Services picked up $18 billion, managed care was $6 billion, and the patients picked up $22 billion. So if you sit there and said, well, I don't want to get involved with insurance, I don't want to do insurance, you're a very small target, you're 2% or less, and you're missing out on $18 billion of revenue from indemnity, $6 billion for managed care. Uh, I don't do managed care. We talked about it earlier taste. We'll talk about it later. But remember, we have to take the money before we give them dental service. Same thing for uh, cleaning, exam, x-rays. I just, you can have someone back and uh, sit there and say, oh, you're not, it's time for bite wings and do a cleaning. Then doctor comes and does an exam. Then they get up front for the first time here. It's $110. And since they're on three month recall and their insurance only covers every six months, um, they're expected to lay down $110 on the cash. That's okay if the patient needs to pay 110 as long as the patient knows that before everything starts. <clears throat> when, when you surprise them up front, then you just start billing them. Then they start not paying. And then, they, then that starts, um, you, you fight back with those scary collection stickers. What happens if you don't pay your mortgage? They take your home. What happens if you don't make your car payment? They take your car. What happens if you don't pay your water bill? They turn off your water. What happens if you don't pay your dental bill? You get another sticker. Woo. You're the most expensive dentist. When, when patients say that, when patients say, you're the highest priced dentist I called, respond, Thank you. I know how hard the dentist in this practice tries to be the best. I'll pass on the good news. I know how much money they have spent on everything from lasers to Cirac 2 to intro cameras to continuing ed. In fact, Dr. Fran was telling me one year he spent $46,000 on continuing education. And I know 
in America, you get what you pay for. So uh, thanks for letting me know that, and I'll pass the word to the dentist. It's all in your attitude. If you think you're expensive, if you think it's not um, a good value, uh, people will say, well, how much is that crown? Or how much is that root planting curatage? And you say, well, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll have Marianne up front tell you that, and I'll jot a little note down what you need, and I'll have her tell you on the way out the door. Um, you know, that's not how it works in any, any store mall. You walk into any uh, place in the world and say, well, how much does this cost? Heck, it's price. It's got a sticker on it. Um, if you are looking for discounted dentistry and medicine, look for the HMO nearest you. That's how I tell my patients. If you want a preferred, when people say, are you a preferred provider? Ask what it, comes, uh, what it takes to become preferred. Is it from passing an exam? Is it from delivering dentistry with airbags, antelope brakes, four-wheel drive, AFFM cassettes, stereo and power windows? Or does preferred provider really mean that you're a discount dentist? At today's dental, we never discount the dentistry. We deliver dentistry unto you as all of our staff would want done unto us. It's our promise. <clears throat> how, do we become, how do you become a preferred provider? Um, do you have to pass a written exam? Do you take 500 hours of continued education and get your fellowship in the Academy of General Dentistry and then take 600 more hours and get your mastership in the Academy of General Dentistry? Do you spend years building the most exceptional dental office team? The answer is no, none of the above. Just cut your fees by a third and you're a preferred provider. What are the insurance companies, um, you know, what, what is this UCR? Does it stand for unusually criminal repair or you, uh, usual customary rate? Dental benefit companies speak unilaterally when they say our fees are too high, yet fail to say their benefits are too low. And staff, you gotta think about this. Where is your bonus and your raise? Do you want to know where your bonus is? Look and see how much your over 90 account receivables are. Do you want to know where your next pay raise is? Look and see how much your over 90 account receivables are. Attention staff, do you want paid on a usual and customary rate basis? Do you want an unusually customary rate pay? You cannot suck blood out of a turnip. The communists tried it for 74 years and eventually the Berlin Wall came down. You can't, your dentist can't afford intro cameras, microabrasion, uh, taking the office on a cruise or taking you to um, Destin, Florida to the Woody Oak Seminar, the Richards Report Seminar in Vegas or continuing education or get the, that latest state-of-the-art equipment you want if you're not collecting the money. And the receptionist, the hygienist, and the assistant have to be on guard on this 24 hours a day because if everybody passed it off like, well, that's just a taboo subject. We don't like to talk about money. And, uh, you know, someone else deals with that. And, you know, the assistants always say, oh, I don't know. I've been a dental officer where the assistants work 10 years. Pacey comes in with a broken tooth. needs a, All they need is a crown. And she has to go up front and wait for wait 30 minutes for someone else to do a financial arrangement. If you've been in office for five years and you can't do a financial arrangement, it's because you you're um, you got a mental block, uh, you feel guilty, you feel dirty. And if I was your dentist, I'd cut your pay 20% because you don't even believe in what they're doing. Remember, dentistry is a $47 billion a year interest, and interest only on master charge and visa is $57 billion a year. So Americans spend $10 billion a year more on interest on their credit card than they do for the entire dental industry. And remember, folks, in 1950, the United States did not have a national credit card company. So this is a relatively new effect. Grandma and Grandpa paid in cash. These people spend uh, $10 billion more on interest than they do on the entire dental industry. Call Visa, 1-800-VISA-311, for a free visa sign for your reception area. Uh, go to your local bank. You see them in every store. You have to accept Visa, Master Charge, American Express, Discover Card. However these people want to pay, um, do it. Uh, another great one, if it's anything, uh, a bigger amount of money, they want to do it longer, call American General Finance at 1-800-597-5977. American General Finance is um, extremely good. You can fax in your loan request. Uh, they get it back to you instantly. Uh, Patrick Wall um, is the one who really got my uh, collections under control. Um, in fact, he has an eight cassette program, uh, which every dental office receptionist should listen to. He even has a year-long program where you turn, um, he focuses on your account receivables, your collection policy, what you're doing, and monitors it every month for a year. Uh, it's the best um, investment you could ever do. Um, another one is sign up for care credit. Care Credit's another one like uh, American General Finance, and Care Credit is 1-800-300-3046, 1-800-300-3046.
Look up loans in your yellow pages to see who makes consumer loans in your area. Um, that, that's an easy one. It's a no-brainer. Uh, there's a lot of um, small business, uh, mom-and-pop shops. There's all kinds of people who will do financing. Dentists always come up to me and say, but see, if you finance a car and you don't pay your bill, they can refinance your car. People, do you really think when you go bankrupt and have a $2 billion or a $2,000 on your visa that they come by your house looking for your shoes and your dresses and Chinese food and, uh, and where's the, the, the Taco Bell trash? Um, most loans in America, uh, consumer loans, are non, are non um, recourse that they can't come back and get them. Um, you know, the, only the big stuff like houses and cars and planes and trains and boats uh, can they actually come back and get some equity or real estate. When you start collecting your money, you massively lower your overhead. Rick Kirshner beat this in my head 10 years ago. He said the collection policy is the number one driver of overhead. He said if you collect $35,000 a month, and or you produce $35,000 a month, and you only collect $30,000, you did $5,000 of dentistry paid for out of the profit of the first 30,000. So, I mean, if you had 60% overhead on the first 30,000, so you netted 40% of 30, you'd have to subtract 5,000 after the dentistry you did and were never paid for. It's the number one driver of overhead, according to Rick Kirster. Another one you could say it would be is fees, but between the fees you charge and how you collect it, that's overhead in a nutshell. Reduce time and expense of collections. Um, the average study on collections um, shows that um, when you do statements, the average statement that you send, by the time you pay the receptionist, the computer, the paper, the 401k, the insurance, all the billing, all everything that's involved with it, it's about $8 per statement per dental office. There are dental offices that do, you know, 40, 50, 100 statements a month. Decrease time and stress your calls. You don't need your receptionist to get off the phone with a collection call and then so to schizophrenically switch personalities to the next nice lady walking in the front door. Um, everybody quotes the 2020 rule. It's all it's uh, um, actually from Vilfredo Pareto. It's called the Pareto rule. The 80/20 rule states that 80% of all events can be attributed to only 20% of their causes. This is Mother Nature's mysterious empirical relationship between cause and effect. It's an eerie little thing that shows up in everything. Um, it's like you know, 80% of your account receivables are from 20% of your patients. 80% of the people, or 20, 80% uh, of the people that came in for a recall in your office last year is from 20% of your charts. Usually, a dentist for a full-time hygienist, 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, 2,000 hours, six-month cleanings would make it 1,000 patient visits. Usually, those thousand um, are about 20% of the charts. Usually, it takes about 5,000 charts for the average dentist to have 1,000 people come in in a year. Uh, the 80/20 shows up uh, all the time. You still see crazy little articles uh, written in a magazine saying, does uh, having a hygienist boost a practice? Answer seems to be yes. If you haven't figured out that you're more productive doing fillings and crowns and root canals for three, four, five, six hundred $600 an hour instead of doing a $60 cleaning, um, I don't know what happened to you. But uh, obviously, obviously, a hygienist is leveraged. A lot of dentists always say, yeah, but I hear that practices that have hygienists have higher overheads. And that is true, but remember, uh, overhead is an artificial yardstick. You know, when you start dealing with philosophy, uh, there, there's no yardstick. Scientists will say, this is a meter, this is a centimeter, uh, this is a millimeter. Philosophers and religions, they, they, they just pull yardsticks out of thin air. And don't focus on the overhead, focus on your net. I'd rather, would you rather have 50% net income of uh, $200,000 a year or do you have 40% net income of $400,000 a year? I mean, do your own math and concentrate on real dollars net to you, not some artificial percentile. You don't pay off your house uh, with a percentage, you pay it off with dollars. Um, the average net income of a solo dentist with a hygienist is 166,000. Without a hygienist, it's 139,000. See, these are real dollars. Uh, these aren't uh, percentages, nominal percentages, uh, numbers pulled out of thin air. This comes once again from the uh, wonderful ADA survey dental practice series statistics 1996. But you know, we talk all throughout the tapes how you can separate dentists according to one determinant variable. You know, do they have a chair empty uh, two out of three days or do, are they all filled once? Do they price the same as specialists or do they probably price less? There's a hundred ways to separate dentists and every time I separate them, um, you can pull them apart anywhere from thirty to seventy thousand dollars, 
And when you have a separation of incomes, 30 to $70,000 based on one determinant variable, that is a very real variable. You have to drive to have a full-time hygienist. In fact, I think the ultimate dentist who do the most dentistry that they prefer are virtually saturated with the dentistry they want to do. They don't do any of the procedures they don't want to do. A lot of them don't like wisdom teeth because they're bloody. They wouldn't even think of implants. A lot of them don't like molar root canals. Um, a lot of them don't like perio surgery. They don't like dealing with kids. And the dentists who sit there and just do their crown and bridge, just do their fillings, and dabble in things that may be interesting but don't do ortho, basically keep all specialists completely booked are the dentists that I call on a two to two where they check two hygienists an hour and work two chairs and refer out everything they don't like and it gets into a no-brainer scenario where you know just almost brainlessly you can walk in there every day and do four crowns you know, half dozen fillings whatever and every day stay on an extremely steady target and bring home two bills a year uh, the RDH after a hygienist name does not stand for receptionist dentist harasser um, this is a team approach um, we still have all kinds of conflict in the dental office where the front office says, well, the assistants are supposed to do that, and the hygienists say, well, I'm not doing this, and, and everybody, you know, the hygienist has her turf, the assistant has her turf, the receptionist has their turf, and nobody has their eye on the customer. Remember, you guys are all on the same team. Keep one eye on your cost, one eye on your customer. Everything else will take care of itself. Scheduling hygiene. If you are booked solid two weeks in advance, you cannot add a new hygiene patient unless a current hygiene patient leaves the practice. Add capacity, increase your turnover speed, or raise your hygiene fees. You need the infrastructure to treat new patients. The most dangerous sign I see in a dental office is when doctor says he has two receptionists, two assistants, one hygienist, and he's had one hygienist for 20 years. And I say, okay, well, how many new patients have you gotten for the last 20 years? He says, we average 30 new patients a month for the last 20 years. I say, wow, why do you think you run off 30 patients every single month? He said, no, no, that's not what I said. I said, I get 30 new patients a month. Well, once your hygienist is filled up and she's uh, booked up a week in advance and you throw 30 new cleanings on, every 30 new patients on every month for 25 years, I mean, that department would build up to six or seven full-time hygienists. So, so if your hygiene capacity is not going up steady with your new patients, then you're losing people. And usually for every new patient the dentist receives, they lose an old patient, and about the only thing that's built up their practice is the fact that it takes three to five years for this patient to drop off and go somewhere else. So they're almost dealing with a float. It's kind of like a, kind of like a mountain. You got 30 new ones coming in, you got 30 ones leaving, but it takes uh, five years for them to get over the top, and that's the 1,000 charts out of your 5,000 charts that happen to come in and get a cleaning on any given year. So the deal is, you're not going to build a huge lake by finding a massive river that flows into it 24 hours a day. You simply need a dam, and if you have a very solid dam, I don't care if it's a little creek feeding this lake, eventually this lake fills up to where you almost can't see across it. So, the, so we have to, back to the hygiene department, we have to find out if you throw 30 new patients on your schedule each month, why are 30 ones coming off? Once again, we got tons of data on this stuff. The top two reasons cited for not getting a six month cleaning, especially when you have indemnity dental insurance that pays 100% for a cleaning exam and x-ray, are simply difficulty in leaving work and difficulty in getting an appointment. Remember, most doctors, dentists, and lawyers are still back in the Henry Ford era in about 1917, where his keen insight was building an assembly line where the capacity of the assembly line equaled demand. It was Ray Kroc who came back in 52 and said, it's different for a service. The capacity has to match the flow because demand doesn't come in steady like an assembly line of 10 million black Model T cars. They come in in waves. <clears throat> and the hygienist is this, in this Henry Ford mentality where she wants to be booked up solid. She thinks that's the most efficient way to use her assembly line, and she's not an assembly line. And then you got the receptionist making it worse because every time someone calls in for a cleaning, she's been trained by a lot of these experts out there that, that well, well, you know, since everybody wants 7 a.m. and everybody wants 5 p.m., 
um, and, and a lot, and everyone wants Saturday and you don't work Saturday and you're not open evenings, don't ask them when they want to come in. Oh, that would be consumer oriented. Just say, well, I got a, a Thursday at two and a Friday at one. Which one of those two works best for you? And then the patient in there like, damn, well, I can't leave work Thursday and Friday we're leaving town and, uh, well, uh, why don't you give me the Friday at one and the consumer's thinking, you know, maybe I can swing it and then the consumer can't swing it, then they don't show up, and then you're all walking around in a hussy saying, I can't believe it, they just scheduled that appointment two days ago, and they didn't show up, these guys are such bastards, they don't respect my time. Well, you don't respect the consumer because you're provider focused, you're not consumer focused. When you call up and ask for an appointment receptionist, you have to say, well, when would you like to come in? And they say, well, you know, I'd really, really like to come in today. I just told you earlier, 7-Eleven. Because um, they, when they started, they were open at 7 and closed at 11 p.m. Those people, do you think it, you save money getting milk? How come mom doesn't sit there and drive across the street, pull into a big grocery store, and walk in there and save 25 to 35 cents on a gallon of milk? I mean, can you even think of an item that you would save money on going into a convenience store? Hell, if you bought a dollar bill, it'd cost you a buck 45. People pay for convenience. Convenience, when you have best service, it's not price related, it's cash flow related. People are driving home from work, they don't wanna deal with the gosh darn grocery store, 10 checkout lanes, people in there buying a week's supply of groceries. They gladly swing in tens of thousands of 7-Eleven, Circle K, Quick Trips, you name it, and they gladly swing in there and pay top dollar for top service, and you're sitting there, hygienist, and, and uh, you know, you're on what I call, the hygienist, the assistant, the receptionist, um, or on what I call the zodiac rays. It's based on some type of ancient religion where you go to your doctor and you say, well, doctor, uh, the earth is an 8,000 mile wide ball of dirt and it's traveling 40,000 miles an hour on this 365.25 day journey around the sun. And every time it passes Pluto, I want a dollar raise. I mean, I mean, that's what your whole staff's raise on. It's based on the zodiac system. Every time the earth travels around the sun once, they want another dollar. What the hell does that have to do with production, collection, efficiency, profitability? I only pay my hygienists 33% of what they produce in the room. Whatever they do in the room, I give them 33% of it because, my gosh, um, you start paying them hourly. You got some Muscovite hygienist from Moscow. She shows up with Stolichnia vodka and a couple boiled potatoes. She only goes to church on Sunday to pray for no-shows. But what she's really saying is, well, doctor, I've met you and I've met me. And when you pay me $25 an hour, then all the risk is on you. That way we transfer all the risk to you and I'm betting on you. And then I sitting there thinking, God, well, if you think you're a loser, you ought to meet me. I'm a bigger loser. This is stressful. I think I won't even have a hygienist. And then you have, you know, a third of the dentist not even getting a hygienist. When you sit there and have a hygienist on hourly, a patient cancels, they'll reschedule him 10 times in a row. In fact, after he misses about the third one in a row, the hygienist starts going up front and say, will you schedule him on Monday morning? That way I can sleep in Monday after I've been at the lake all day drinking whiskey on Saturday and Sunday. Or I know, why don't you schedule him the last patient on Friday afternoon so I can leave the lake early? And, um, you know, um, when you start paying them on uh, percentage, my gosh, they miss one or two. The hygienist says, forget it. You're not putting him on my schedule. I sat here for an hour twice waiting for that no good rotten, and it's usually males. I don't know what the deal is, but most people who no show visits, they're almost entirely males, and the ones that aren't, I always wonder if they're lesbian, because it's just a, it's a male-driven deal. I don't know what it is, they, they, if they're scatterbrained, hopped up on hormones, whatever it is, but when your hygienist is on 33% commission, she says no. I'm not going to reschedule this guy again. He no-showed me twice. You tell him if he wants to make another appointment, he can pay me for the last two that he missed while I sat here for an hour wondering where the hell he was. Same thing with confirming appointments. You got a hygienist on hourly. Five o'clock, man, she's out the door. Hell, her mind was out the door 15 minutes ago. Her body's just running to catch up with her. And then she goes home. She's in her own world, no community service, all into herself. And you got a hygienist on 33% commission. She walks up to the front desk say, okay, am I all confirmed for tomorrow? You got to hold everybody. And here's a reception. She's got one person on hold, another person online, someone else checking out. And she says, you know, I was never able to get a hold of this patient over here, Tom Trinkner and Tony Gallagos. And I, you know, I, I don't know what the deal is. And she's sitting there thinking, my gosh, she hasn't been able to get a hold of them. But isn't Trinkner married to this lady who, our patient here? Or didn't his wife come in? Well, and she's sitting there going through the soft end computer. And she's pulling down a work number, a home number, a cell number. And it's another thing. You got really good data 
in phone numbers and faxes when you got the computer terminal in each hygiene operatory. I have the computer terminal software in every one of my eight operatories. I got two in the doctor's office, one in the office managers, one in the, um, the, the patient treatment uh, um, coordinator room. I got one in the break room. I got four up front. I got these things everywhere because that's our management information system. And I and you notice when you pay hygienist thirty three percent of production, you look up anybody's phone number. You always got the office number, the home number, the work number, the fax number, the boyfriend's number, the girlfriend's number. I mean, they'll pull up five, six different numbers because that hygienist knows three months, four months. Six months later, they might not be able to get a hold of you at work. So they want your home number. They'll also load in their family members. Uh, who referred you? Because you might be scrolling around and say, well, you were referred by another treatment. I wonder if that's your brother. I'll call your brother. Hey, Mark, where's your, where, where's your brother, Tom? This is Susie Q at the Today's Dental. I'm trying to find him to confirm his hygiene appointment. Mark, he's not there. And then he can say, oh, Tom, oh, I'm sorry. He just left for a two-week cruise to Panama Canal. She's like, wow, thanks for letting me know. And, and she hasn't left yet. And she's already put everyone alert. Tomorrow, we have a 10 o'clock opening. So if anybody calls, uh, we don't close till 7. Anybody calls the next two hours and wants a cleaning, I got a 10 o'clock. She can also go around to the hygienist or get working there tomorrow. Um, do you guys think any of these patients um, will need a cleaning tomorrow? And the dental assistant's going, well, you know, we got an emergency coming in at 9 o'clock. And I'm kind of, the doctor's still going to be busy because at 8 o'clock, he's got two crowns and a filling in this room. And God, it's all the same to you. Uh, I'd love it if you took that 9 o'clock and did a FMX and uh, had Dr. Men do an exam. Maybe you can clean his teeth and stall him for an hour and clean his teeth because I'd just as soon do this guy at 10 o'clock or whatever. You get the whole team focusing. Why? Because economic theory is only three legs of the stool. It's everyone's going to make decisions and it's based on incentives. And the incentives are based on how you set up their job description and your business corporate strategy based on the score. The scores from the management information system, uh, we use SoftDent and uh, Peachtree Accounting, and it's all incentives. If you don't have incentives, your hygiene department goes to hell in a handbag circuit. So um, basically, um, a lot of people also complain that there's no hygienists in their area. Um, the United States has 1,828 people per ever dentist, and they have 5,093 people per hygienist. So if you got 1,828 people per dentist, 5,093 people per hygienist, uh, based on a 1998 U.S. population of 276 million, a lot of dentists whine. And, you know, and that, that's where the difference between a conservative and a socialist comes in. You know, a conservative, when he has a problem, um, he doesn't whine and whine and go to the government and whine. I mean, I had a dentist the other day. I, I mean, this goes back, um, I think, about 1990. A dentist in a small town in Idaho, he's a town of 2,000, he's saying, yeah, but you know, it's no, you know I, I can't, none of this applies to me because, see, I'm in a town of 2,000 and there aren't any hygienists. I said, well, gosh, are, are, you a, are you a conservative, Republican, Democrat, socialist, or communist? Where, where are you on the spectrum here? I said, I said uh, uh, if you're a communist, you should go right to the dictator and demand that he takes two girls off the street, puts them in jail, trains them to be hygienists, and returns them to your area. I said, if you're a conservative, and you're living in a town in 2000 Idaho. Well, this isn't the chiropractor's problem. This isn't the podiatrist's problem. It's not the school teacher's problem. It's your problem. You're the only dentist in this damn town. What you're telling me is you've practiced here for 20 years. And since you're the only dentist in this town for 20 years, there's no hygiene. Hell, I moved into Phoenix, Arizona, third largest unfloridated city in America. Two years after I walked in this town, it was fluoridated, and you're whining that a town of twenty of 2,000 hasn't got a hygienist while you've been living in it for 20 years? I said, come on, think, think. How could you solve that problem? He goes, well, hell, Howard, I don't know. I said, why don't you do this? I said, how much is, wh wh where's the closest local hygiene school? Told me where it was. I said, what's, what's tuition there? He said, it's, uh, he, we called up, and it was about $2,000 a semester. And it was a two-year program, so total tuition be eight grand. I said, how much more money does a dentist, the average dentist, make with a hygienist than without a hygienist? He said, I don't know, um, what your, whatever your chart was, 30, 40,000 bucks. I said, so it's 2,000 a semester? Don't look at 8,000 bucks, just look at cash flow. It's only 2,000 a semester, $4,000 a year. Why don't you go to your local high school? I said, the most painful thing for seniors in high school is every time they go home, every time they go to a family reunion, every time they see grandma and grandpa, everybody's saying, so Megan, what are you going to be when you grow up? And Megan hates that question because everybody's coming down on her. What are you going to be? She has no flipping idea. 
<clears throat> it's self-esteem issues, it's interest levels, it's monetary issues. She just doesn't know. You go to that local high school, talk to the principal, and say, um, I'd like to sponsor an essay contest. And let's have an essay contest, why I want to be a dental hygienist, and the number one winner gets a free scholarship to the hygiene school up the street. And now you got all these little girls sitting there thinking, well, I, you know, I get my teeth clean, and hell, that's a good job. And you know, I was thinking maybe a nurse or something, and... Uh, well, God, I, I'm going to see if I can win. And, and sure enough, he does this thing. Only three girls in the whole damn school write the essay. So he calls me and says, what should I do? How will you read these essays? I don't know which one I should use. And I said, no, I'm nuts. You've been there 20 years. There's no hygiene. I said, send all three. I said, what is it, 6000 a semester? Who gives a crap? People are pigeons. If that girl was born in a town of 2000, she's the only person on the planet stupid enough to move back to that city. I said, you think some girl's going to be born in San Diego and move to a town of 2000 in the middle of Bumblebutt, Idaho? The only chance you've got is that hygienist doesn't marry someone else. Uh, and, and if she does marry someone else and move to like Seattle or Portland or something, as soon as she gets pregnant, her biology 101 organs are going to say, I want to be where my mama is, where my mama can watch the baby and help me and my sisters and family, you know, whatever. And he said, all three of them there. And hell, that was 10 years ago. He's got hygienists coming out as wazoo. You take care of your own problems. Don't be wa uh, whining to Washington, D.C. every time you got a problem. Make hygienists. Create hygienists. Um, same thing with um, local hygiene schools. I've been in areas where they're so underserved with hygiene. And then I look at their local hygiene school and 10 or 15 um, out of 20 seats are from another state. You guys, you need to focus on supply and demand. We don't even, I mean, to take the number of hygienists out there. Look, um, if there's 5,000 people per hygienist, and a hygienist working 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, cleaning your teeth twice a year, that'd be no three-month recalls, no four-month recalls, just six-month hour cleanings. We have enough hygienists for one in every five person in America. So today we got a situation where if 276 million Americans wanted to get their teeth cleaned twice a year, we'd have to tell four out of every five, sorry, there's no room in the end, go find a manger and scrape your own teeth. Um, th this is a, a, a serious problem. Um, the macro view of hygiene enrollment versus graduation has actually been extremely steady. Uh, at 1996, we're at the same level we were in 78. Yet remember, the United States, after you have births and immigrants subtract out the deaths, the United States, since World War II, every year averages between an increase of a population of 2.3 million to 2.6 million. Every, the high and the low is 2.6 million to 2.3 million, and your hygiene uh, graduation class has been flat for the last 30 years. Let's beef up these schools. And another thing, every dentist out there, if they wanted to turn their hygiene situation around, would go to their hygiene schools and start doing what all the law schools did. Put in an evening class. You know, all these hygiene schools are still the old thinking institutes. You know, all the old thinking institutes are Monday, they start at Monday at eight, and they go till Friday at noon or five, and it just, and you literally have to take off two years to become a hygienist. Law schools now, everywhere in California and all the big cities, you have a daytime job, and at night you can go and become a lawyer, and it's a three-year program, and what they need to do is they need to have, there are dental assistants that have been doing dental assisting for 10 years that would kill to be a hygienist if they had an evening program that was maybe six to 10, uh, two nights a week, and maybe Saturdays for two years or whatever, and you need to become entrepreneurs and get together with your local state dental society and maybe they call the ADA. Um, they've got um, tons of agencies. Go down the ADA on 211 Chicago Avenue. Hell, the building's 22 stories high. Uh, they got more agencies, more departments. But think about how you're going to increase this uh, hygiene so that at least half of America could get a cleaning. Um, percent of dentists who employ hygienists, um, you know, 35% don't have one. 25% of the dentists have one. 20% have two and 20% have three. The average dentist has 1.8 hygienists. The average specialist has 2.1. Um, hygienists are very interesting in the fact that the, um, they have the lowest staff turnover of any department. Usually dental assistants and receptionists, um, they're turning about every four years. Um, associate dentists turn about every five, and hygienists average uh, turn about every six. Their average hourly rates are about 23 to 25 bucks. Um, the average experience, um, experience for a hygienist out there today has 14 years experience in the field. Um, you're telling me that a hygienist has a two or a three or four year college degree and uh, they average 14 years experience 
and you're a low self-esteem doctor <clears throat> and you don't have an intraoral camera in your hygienist room, she's not allowed to co-diagnose or co-exam or sit there and talk over the patient and then you want to go in there for a five-minute exam and since you're a doctor and she's not, um, you know, th th that's all low self-esteem. Remember, the whole is going to be greater than the sum of its parts. The first rule of biology is the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The first rule of physics is chaos theory. It's 2 plus 2 equals 5. If you mount an intraoral camera in the foot of the chair on the wall when the patient's setting up and can watch like when she's, um, when the hygienist's taking a bite wings or FMX are developing and she's plugged in maybe Rella Christian's hygiene tape, teaching them how to brush and floss and fluoride treatments and all that kind of stuff. Or when the patient's laying on the back, she could be watching home care instructions or maybe a little five or 10 minute demo tape. Uh, patient education from Gordon Christian about explaining bleaching, bonding veneers or different types of fillings, um, tooth color direct, indirect, gold, what have you. The hygienist, and, and the other thing with the market is men have very high confrontational tolerance compared to women. Men are 10 times more likely to say to the hygienist, well, why, why should I do that? Well, do I have to have a root canal? Can I just have a filling? Or why do I need that? They'll ask questions all day long. But when male doctor walks in the room, and mom's a little introvert, she's a little shy, and doc says, well, you need a crown or root canal. And she's sitting there thinking, well, I wonder why he just doesn't do two sealants there. But she won't say anything most of the time. But she lowers that bar. She talks to the uh, hygienist all day long. So if you don't empower your hygienist, give her the tools necessary so she can explain clinical dentistry, um, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Average hygienist is about... $25 an hour as in 1995, and, uh, and the average assistant in 1995 um, was right around uh, $12 an hour. So you tell me if the average assistant's at $12 an hour and the average hygienist at $25 an hour, that if you're a local hygiene school, put in a night program, just like I went to night school for get my MBA or my master's in public health or any continued education. In fact, even, um, even our law school out here is thinking about putting an evening program. Uh, and that's after, in the last 35 years, America puts out 38,000 lawyers a year, whereas 40 years ago, it was only 8,000 lawyers a year. They have a fourfold increase, and they're still adding capacity. I think there are at least 10,000 dental assistants out there today who, if they could go to school two nights a week and maybe Saturdays or whatever, they'd be a hygienist in two years. Um, the average number of yearly visits to a general dentist is 3.5, special six, but the average length of time um, per visits, 45 minutes for a general dentist, 35 minutes for a specialist, but the, and the average number of patient visits per week with a hygienist is 80 visits a week for a general dentist, 105 for a specialist. Um, so the deal is, if you're a hygienist, you know, if she, the average number of patient visits per week with a hygienist is 80 visits a month, do you realize how much internal marketing, patient education, relationship building, if she's in a uniform with a name tag, she's empowered in her operatory, she has all of her plaques and diplomas. If you take a continued course, like say you, um, you send her up to Provo to go to one of Gordon's PCC two-day courses, or MT's Monji's, or you send her through LVI, or our University Pacific with Hornbrook, or, and every time they give you graduation plaques, graduation ceremonies, and my high just the entire wall is filled with their plaques and trophies and, and their, their I, one has even got this Hugh Freedy Golden, Golden Scalar Award she won in dental school. Well, when they walk in there, she's in a uniform. She's in a name tag. She's got a $12,000 intro camera. You lean back. She's got the camera now. She's talking. You see her plaques and diploma. This woman is elevated to somewhere between the level of a nurse to a, you know, a physician. I mean, she's empowered and patients listen. She's 10 times less intimidating. So consumers talk back with her. You walk in, then the first thing you always say to the patient, because you're low self-esteem, you always walk in and go, I'm a doctor and you're not. You need two root canals. Then you leave the room. And I mean, that's just weird. You, you don't, you go home to your mom at Christmas, say, hello, mom, this is, I'm Dr. Ferran. You must be, uh, is it Colleen? Um, you, you don't say that to your friends. If you don't say it to your friends, you don't say it to your family, you don't say it to your dog, your neighbors, your fishing buddies. I mean, uh, it, it took me a year just to get my stupid, I shouldn't say stupid, my uh, very sweet maid to quit calling me Dr. Friend. It's like, you know, do you want to be called Dr. Linda? I don't want to be called Dr. I don't want to be called Numbnuts, Howard, uh, Buddy, Friend. Uh, I want you to communicate. Anything I do to artificially raise the barrier of communication is always going to hurt me far more than it's going to hurt the consumer. So get these hygienists empowered, uniform, name tag, trophies, plaques, diplomas. Get that room to be her room. Make her an entrepreneur within your entrepreneurship. New patients per month. If you got 10 new patients a month, 
if your hygiene capacity was 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, 2,000 hours a year, six month three calls only, no three or four months, just to make it easy and sweet, you start throwing in, and Ken James and I, Ken James, I, I stole more of my recall from Ken James in Kent, Washington, can I get this nuked, um, than probably anybody else, and Ken told me that basically, he said, um, by the time you throw in some three-month recalls, some four-month recalls, and some kids who get 30 minutes cleanings, he, I don't think he said he's ever had a hygienist that could really service more than 650 people a year. So I mean incredibly generous at 1,000, okay? 1,000 is incredibly generous, yet on only 20 new patients a month, it only takes you 50 months to add a new hygienist. 30 new patients a month, you'd add a hygienist every 33 months. 40 new patients a month would mean every 25 months you'd add a hygienist, which, so in reality, if you're getting 40 new patients a month, you would add a full-time hygienist every two years, and you know in your office you've had one hygienist for 10 years, and you might get 40 new patients a month. So think about why they're not coming back. It has to do with availability, accessibility, um, trying to get time off work, you know, back in that industrial revolution mode, you know, 1960, when 33% of America worked for the Fortune 500, and now it's 13%, the Fortune 500 are the ones that can leave during the day because they got way too many people. They're very inefficient. And uh, today, most of your patients work for small business. Maybe they work for a little advertising company or graphics design layout or retail or this or that or this or that. But most Americans work for a company. The far majority of Americans work for a company that does less than a million dollars a year and has less than 25 employees. And when anybody leaves, it's a big pain. You gotta get your recall going. Three to six month recalls for perio patients. And remember, what does every endodontist do that um, general dentist doesn't do as far as standard care of a root canal? Ended on us, got to know the score. If you don't know the score, it can't change your decision making feedback. And forget the incentives, just the score will change your decision. Endodontists always have their root canals back for one year periapical to make sure the lesion shrank up and healed. And, and if it didn't shrink up, and you know, it's the feedback they know. That endodontist, that's why endodontists have the highest endodontic, uh, highest endodontic failure rate because they're the only one tracking. If an endodontist tells you, I have a 4% failure rate, you're sitting there thinking, God, that's terrible, man. You lose four out of 100 root canals. I haven't lost one in 20 years. Yeah, but then you go to all the endodontists around you, and 50% of all the root canals they do are your retreats. So we all have endodontic failures. Um, it's hard to say what they are. I mean, I see anything in literature from maybe uh, 4 to 10% failure rate over a 10 year period of time, but having all root canals back a year later for a PA is another great reinforcement for patient tracking. So hygienists, if you ever see a person come in and thought, oh wow, um, he's missed his last cleaning, it's been a year since he's been in, last time he was in he had a root canal, be sure to take a PA of that root canal, you bill it out with insurance, but give that to the doctor because they need to start looking at uh, their success rates, change their techniques, maybe that'll help them go into some .04 tapers, 300 RPM night ties, go see Cliff Ruddle, Ben Johnson, G. John Schofel, John McSpadden, Kit Weathers, Patrick Wall, whoever they need to see. The recall starts with the, with the check-in, check-out procedure we talked about. Every time we check them in, you know, we, t we have a, a separate clipboard checking in, greet patients, sign it off, update address, update insurance, verifying financial agreement, notify clinical staff, yada, yada, yada. But it also, on the checkout, check that recall schedule. By just going to an operation logistics point of view and making sure that the assistant doesn't pass the ball, she parks them up front, and the receptionist pulls down a clipboard, has to check off these exact six things, that makes it a system. It makes it a bulletproof system. No one leaves without paying their bill, without scheduling their recall, yada, yada, yada. That's, it. That's the number one reason that on any given day, today, today I, I can't say we really have four hygienists going. That's our ideal, two hygienists going for uh, um, every dentist working two chairs. So with eight rooms, my ideal situation is four full-time hygienists with uh, two full-time doctors each using two chairs. Uh, but in reality, I'm the most honest guy. I'll tell you my uh, deepest uh, problems and fears and all that stuff. Um, we, we probably average about three. For every day, we got four. There's another one with two. Um, this operational logistic checkout, that's also when we do the exit interview. This is very good for the exit interview. And receptionists help the hygienist sit there and say, how was your cleaning? Now remember, there is no such thing as a good cleaning. You know this by when you start doing um, exit interviews. I have some of the best hygienists in the world. There'll be a new patient come in. They'll, they'll have their clean. They'll how was it? They go, oh, everything's fine. And remember, they'll circle, they'll circle on a one to five, five being great. 
five being very satisfied, four being only satisfied. Remember, if a person doesn't check five and they check four, they're six times more likely not to come in and they'll check a satisfied and the receptionist go, well, I, I, I mean, that, that's nice and that's okay, but just tell me, why wasn't it very satisfied? And she'll sit there and, and the bizarre things they say is, well, you know, I had a really good hygienist in St. Louis and she had this, like this baking powder machine gun thing and she sprayed down all my teeth and my God, it just really cleaned them out and this girl, she didn't do any of that or anything like that. And you need to comment. Hygienist, if satisfaction equals perception minus expectation, why don't you ask every patient, by the way, is there, how do you usually get your tea cleaners? You know, if, if you go get a massage, they say, do you want deep or do you want medium or do you want light? Um, and you know, my wife and I were at Maui and uh, two, two tables going at the same time. My wife likes a little tickle massage. I like to like grunting, groaning, getting torn up, beat up. Everybody has their expectations of what they want. Um, some people say they, they, they hate that little, that little electric thing, that thing that makes that zzz noise and it really hurts their teeth. Some say I had a really good hygienist because she would use nitrous oxide or she would put that topical anesthesia or she would uh, give me a lidocaine rinse that they got from the pharmacy, a 2% xylocaine rinse or whatever, whatever it is. The easiest way to satisfy someone is to find out how they keep score. I will, I do a lot of uh, lecture engagements and they'll bring me in for certain meetings and I'll say, who brought me in? I want to know who is writing the check for 6,500 bucks, a plane ticket and a hotel room. I find that person. First thing I always say is, uh, by the way, what were you expecting? Maybe it's a periodontist bringing me in for his referring doctors or that, you know, there's a lot of specialists, things like that. And he'll say, well, I, you know, I was really hoping that after today they would really learn uh, all about like uh, fresh breast centers and chlorine dioxide and all that. And I'm sitting there thinking, Jiminy Christmas. I mean, I wouldn't plan on talking about that if it was the last thing in China. I would have had to talk for 50 hours before that would have came up on a subject. I'm so glad I found out how you keep score. I'm much more likely to go back and get an A. How did you get an A in dental school? I mean, it was so easy in college. All you do is after you're all done studying, you, you know, you'd raise your hand. Well, how many questions are going to be? And you say, oh, it's going to be uh, 40 questions, multiple choice. And what's it going to be over? Books or notes? Books, notes, more books. Uh, it'll mostly be out of the book. So then you just go back and you think, okay, I know this guy. Well, I'm just going to trade some hats with him. I'm going to General Patton. I'm going to be Rommel. I'm, uh, I'm the student. I'm going to be this teacher. I sat down, and what I would do is I would sit down and say, I'm the teacher. I'm writing 40 multiple choice questions out of this three chapters. And I would sit there, and I would go through the chapter. I'd write every question I had. And what I used to like the most is it'd be a 40-question deal, and I could come up with maybe 110 multiple choice questions. And what I liked the most was not getting them all right, but was coming back and saying every damn question he asked was out of my list of 112. I mean, how many questions can you ask? So you've got to know the score. But here's the killer issue, getting to yes. I've got to know, hygienists, you cannot have people calling to get in a cleaning today and they say, well, I, I'd really like to get one this week. First thing you got to ask them reception is why? And they'll say, well, I, I got a job interview Monday. I, I got a date Friday night. I got this big interview coming up. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in a film shoot. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Then they come into your practice and here you're this religious dogmatic and you're saying, well, I know you're expecting to have your teeth cleaned today, but I can't clean your teeth today because you need four quarters of rape waiting carry dog. And, rah, 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 rah. and it's like, well, can't you compromise? I mean, the person wants his teeth cleaned for a date or a job interview. You're all wigged out about four or five or six millimeter pockets. Can't you clean his teeth so he's happy? and then get them back for four quadrants of root plane keratosis? Does everything have to be so religiously dogmatic? And then hygienists always come up to me and say, yeah, but you know, you could get sued for doing a regular cleaning if they need a root plane keratosis. Hygienists, look at your malpractice insurance premium. You know, when it's $12 a year, guess what? There's not many lawsuits in dental hygiene world. A gosh darn doctor delivers babies, his malpractice premium is $85,000 a year. And plus, if you take good notes and it's reasonable, remember the essence of law, the judges ask, basically, is this reasonable? Is this what a reasonable person would expect what you meant? Is this what a reasonable customer thought they were trading for? And if you take good notes and it's reasonable, Judge Wapner's going to not throw you in the pen. Um, when the phone rings, uh, when the phone doesn't ring, you'll know it's me. That's the 30, 40 patients a month falling off the hygiene schedule uh, that are being replaced by the 30 to 40 new patients. We've got to find out why they don't come back. Most of the hygiene appointment is simply availability. You know, every time I call in there, they give me this time and it really didn't work my schedule. So I said, I call back, quit telling them when to come in and start asking them when they want to come in.
first thing you got to do, hygienist, is you got to sell the score. What is the value of preventive dentistry? We already talked earlier that if you get 100% coverage for a clean exam and x-ray, almost 8 in 10 Americans won't even utilize it. So the first thing you got to do is, well, what is the real value of getting my teeth clean? You know, you got to talk to them that 27 0.4 out of 100 Americans wear a denture at age 65, yet 99.99% of hygienists don't. When's the last time you've been to a hygiene convention and you saw a bunch of old hygienists there around with dentures and flippers and partials? How come you keep all your teeth and they don't? Now, first question I would ask a hygienist is, is there any demographic segmentation variables in my market? Well, I told you that 89% of the dentures and partials being converted to implant or same prosthesis were women, 89%. Because it's not about form and function, it's about dignity and self-esteem and girdles and pointy shoes and makeup and hair. And they're not taking their lower teeth out because that hurts their dignity. And, you know, a lot of them have had a denture for 40 years. Their husband never seen it out without it once. Go into the periodontal root planing curatage market. It's almost 65% women only. So two-thirds of your market is women, one-third is men. Why? Because if grandpa lost... Uh, a tooth or two, he's like, well, you know, I lost my hair, I got a liver spot. I mean, grandpa's self-esteem was defined by his ego, by being a provider, by his job. And women still far more value their looks, their dignity, and women don't want to lose teeth. When you start telling women who have a four or five or six millimeter pocket that 27 out of 100 are wearing a partial or a denture at 65, they think of that as like wearing a glass eye or a wig on their head or a wooden foot. They don't want anything fake or artificial. So when you start telling them the score that 99% of hygienists do not wear dentures and parcels at 65, whereas one in four Americans do, and then you show a list of your hygienists uh, that haven't had a cavity. Donna Moore's last cavity was 72. Mine was 1980. Chris Sixon's was 1972. Uh, Jan's was 83. Uh, the newest one in our office, uh, our latest cavity was 1987. Uh, we, we walk our talk when it comes to preventive dentistry. And the, re the front office got to sell this. People say, well, you know, uh, you know, they'll call up to cancel an appointment. Receptionists always pull a chart. Pull a chart and say, and, and if it's easier to pull a chart if the phone has a 20 or 30 foot cord, okay? Don't give me this little six inch cord. You go down to Radio Shack, get a 30, 40 foot cord, plug it in. I don't care if there's cord all over the trash can area, the floor, I don't care if you're wheeling over. You take that phone right to the chart and you open up. And, and receptionist, when you open up that chart and this person's canceling and cleaning, and it's a woman, and you're looking at the chart, and there's a woman over 40, and she had a four or five millimeter pocket. If you can't talk her out of confirming a reschedule, you're not even communicating. I mean, you can just sit there and say, Mary, you're 42 years old. And you, of all people, you have insurance that pays for this clean exam and x-ray 100%, and you have gum disease. You have it on your upper right. You have it on your lower left. I'm looking at the hygienist notes. Mary, your insurance company covers 100% of clean exams, x-rays. 99.9% .9 of hygienists have all their teeth. Uh, they do not wear dentures and partials. And one in four, or 27% of Americans wear a denture or partial at 65. Now remember, Mary, if you don't floss when you're a kid, you get cavities, fillings, crowns, root canals. But if you don't floss from 45 to 65, it's not a question of if you get gum disease. It's how severe and how much, uh, what will it take to reverse it, periodontal surgery or regular cleanings. Um, I don't know. I would really rethink about rescheduling this. Uh, we've had this book. You know you need it. When people come up to the front office of the hygienist, they go, God, I can't believe how much a root canal and a crown cost. Man, they told me that the root canal billet and crown is going to be $1,395. And then the receptionist got to, they got to stand your ground and say, really, you know, um, you know, I, uh, I don't really know. I haven't had a cavity since 1980. So, you know, I haven't even had a cavity, a filling, crown, root canal for 18 years. So, you know, it's hard for me to be in your shoes, but I guess that is expensive. But I'll tell you this. Here's another handout, communication, handout, um, warranties. Uh, $1,395 for root canal, bill, and crown would have paid for a six-month cleaning 12 times. That's six years worth of cleanings. And Margaret, I'm looking at your chart. You haven't had your teeth cleaned in five years. And what's crazier is you have insurance that pays 100% for it. You know why? Because the insurance would have rather paid 100% for a clean exam and x-ray 
and they know the value of that if we can teach you to get your teeth clean, start flossing, whatever, maybe they wouldn't have incurred this $1,395 bill today. So it's communication, communication, communications. It absolutely astounds me that when you look at the procedures of uh, root plane curatage, two-thirds women, implants, almost 90, 89% women, that we don't talk more about the score. Now, we can't have these people waiting for a new appointment. The average number of days to wait for a new patient to get an appointment to the average general dentist is eight days, average plus seven days. The average number of days to wait for an existing patient record to get in for appointment is also eight days for a general dentist and seven days for an average specialist, according to the ADA. And uh, waiting for a dental appointment is a design choice from the initial process and capacity design. So when these people are waiting for a cleaning for a week, but they're only waiting three minutes for a Big Mac, and they go by, you know, you go to any car lot, they've already got their inventory. When people are waiting, it's from your operations and logistics initial process design. Now, I lecture about, usually about every week, about 50 times a year. And when I fly out there and do a Friday or Saturday lecture, I always fly home that night. Because if I choose to save money, you know, I could save, you know, when I, I fly to Phoenix, I could save on the average 500 bucks by flying home Sunday morning. But if I did that, sure the hotel bill would only be $89 and I'd save $500 on the airfare, but from the initial design, I would be gone 50 more days from my four boys ages three, five, seven, and nine. So I initially said that's not acceptable. I also will pay top dollar I don't want to layover because if, if, I, if I had 50 flat cities a year, and every one of them had a layover, that would be a hundred extra layovers, you know, one on the way there, one on the way back. But think about plane capacity, okay? Friday and Saturday nights, the plane flies home half empty. If this airplane has a hundred seats filled at $800 each, out of 200 seats, that's $80,000. So Friday and Saturday nights, they fly home half empty at $800 a seat for $80,000 of revenue. You go there Sunday morning, now the plane is filled to the brim and instead of $800, it's $200. They fly home completely filled, 200 seats filled, at 200 each for a total revenue of $40,000. Well, what, what am I saying here? Friday and Saturday night, the plane's half empty, and it's 800 bucks a seat, and they have 80,000 in revenue. Sunday morning, the plane's filled to the brim for half the revenue, at $200 a seat. Why? Because the last Nobel-winning economist, um, Arno Penzias, Bell Labs chief scientist said, there are people who will spend time to save money and people who will spend money to save time. Those are the two different markets. Do you know why I can always fly home Friday or Saturday night without a reservation? Because they, they know that the Fortune 500, there's people out there. I mean, if you make 60,000 bucks a month and you want to fly home and see mama and see the boys and get laid and the whole nine yards, you walk onto that airline and you expect an empty seat. So when you're paying 800 bucks, you're paying for that empty seat. That empty seat is called capacity. There's only two markets. Those that will spend time to save money, who will gladly do a Saturday night stay over and fly home Sunday morning, because grandma will call them and go, $800, I can't afford that. They'll say, well, Granny, if you fly home uh, Sunday morning when all the Fortune 500 CEO traveling businessmen are still asleep, um, you, you owe $200, you go, oh, thank you. I'll be there Sunday morning, I'll have my crochet and my little kitty cat on my lap, and that'll work perfect for me. And hygienists are back in this gosh darn Henry Ford thing. If I pose this question to the hygienist, which is better? Eight, eight hour day, have eight one hour patients. Every hour have a patient, eight appointments, eight hours a day, at $70 each for 560 bucks, you'd be 100% efficient, which means you're running at 100% capacity and you have a bottleneck. Or would you rather do seven cleanings on an eight hour day for $80, still drive $560 of revenue, but only be running at 87.5% of capacity, which means you still have 12.5% open capacity. And I just say, oh, well, the bottom's very bad because see, the person only had seven cleanings on an eight hour day. They had a cancellation, they had a dosha. That is wrong, wrong, wrong. Look at your, your hygiene department is like a, a go-kart. You got your left, you got your left foot's your brake. That's raising your prices. Your right foot is your gas. That's increasing capacity, either uh, adding another hygienist or increasing your speed. Instead of doing hour cleanings, do 45-minute cleanings or 40-minute cleanings or half-hour cleanings. We only do hour cleanings because I do not believe people come in to efficiently get their hair done in 20 seconds or less and then stick their hand in a nail machine that instantly does their nails. 
I believe that the majority of people who get their teeth clean, it's the same experience as getting their nails done, their hair done, a massage. They want to go in there, lay back, relax, have someone talk to them, build a relationship, fuss over them, talk to them, talk about the cats and dogs. It's almost kind of like mama's time. I mean, ask your wife next time she goes and gets her hair done or her nails done if she'd like you and the four boys to go with her and all sit around her feet while she's getting it done. My God, she'd laugh so hard, snot would fly all over her nose. She's like, hell no, that's my time. People don't want these quick wham, bam, thank you, ma'am cleanings unless you're in the HMO market where it's only best price and they're not interested in best service and best product. But hygienists, you gotta raise your fees. You gotta be available. When people call up and they ask for a cleaning, you say, when would you like to come in? If you can't give it to me, write it down. When I come into your office and, um, Actually, I don't do it anymore, but you do it yourself. That's what this tape program is about. And you're seeing that you're telling one or two people a day, no, who wanted it in that day or the next morning and you don't have capacity, yet you're still charging $70 for a cleaning, yet every time the stupid earth travels around the sun one revolution, you come back out with your handout for another dollar pay raise? This doesn't make sense. You need to charge your fee so you always have capacity. Every Fortune 500 company has capacity, they have inventory, they have excess capacity in the service industry to match your flow, see all the checkout lines of the grocery store, or Barnes and Nobles, or the bank drive through tellers, and assembly lines have excess capacity in storage. You go to car lots, every one of them has a 50, 60, 100 cars of inventory parked off, so that a wave of people walk in after a football game on Sunday and they saw all the ads come down and get a new car, they've got it. If you don't have inventory of empty seats, then you don't you can't capture the highest amount of money. So um, the top two reasons cited we talked about for not getting a cleaning were simply they can't leave work and they're difficult to get an appointment. So why aren't you open at seven o'clock to get an hour cleaning in there before they go to work at eight or another cleaning at eight before they go to work at nine? And why do you take your lunch from 12 to one when everybody else does? Take your lunch from one to two so you can get a lunch hour in there. And what about after work at five? And the other thing that drives me crazy about those hours, you say, well, those hours, we do some of those, but they're booked up two months in advance. Well, then, my gosh, then do the Sunday, um, Saturday night, uh, Sunday airplane deal. Why do you charge the same amount of money for a cleaning at 7 a.m. that's booked up three months in advance as you do for the one at 10 o'clock a.m. that nobody wants? And when Grandma calls up and she says, well, yeah, I'd like to get a cleaning. And uh, I'm 70 years old and I have a liver spot the size of a silver dollar on every appendage. And uh, since I go to bed at midnight and get up at four, I'd like the seven o'clock cleaning. And we say, well, Margaret, you know, that's fine. We'll put you in at seven o'clock, but you know, that slot is $95 because most people are at work and it's hard to get off and that thing books up two months advance. But you know, we give a $20 discount. It's only $75 for a cleaning if you come either at 10 o'clock or 2 o'clock when there's only retired people and stay-home mom with kids. And grandma instantly says, oh my gosh, I'd save $20 coming in at 10 or at 1? Why are you pricing the same for one appointment time booked up a month in advance for another appointment time that usually has no one there? Increase your fees. Remember, a 10% fee increase means you can make the same money doing only 74% of your dentistry. So if you raise your hygiene fee 10%, if you had 26% openings, you'd be doing, uh, you'd, be, you'd be even from that point on. A 20% fee increase means you can do the same profit doing only 59% of your cleanings. So if you raise your fee 20%, what does that do? That's the brake pedal. That slows down all this excess buildup. Now a 20% fee increase, 40% of your cleanings open up with empty chairs, you already paid for it by the 20% fee increase on the other six out of 10. And now you got capacity to raise your fees to have people come in, pay top dollar uh, for the cleaning they want today. People pay for service at 7-Eleven. They pay for service when they call 9, 10 dental offices. You're the only one that can get them in today. So think about that. And, um, and as far as dentistry, I mean, my gosh, Americans spent 1.23% of their money on tobacco and 11% on transportation, dentistry was 0.89%. Consumers spent over $50 billion on lots of things other than dentistry. So build capacity, either increase your chairs, go faster or raise your prices, but do not tell me I can go to your city and buy a bag of pot on four different street corners, have a pizza delivered in 30 minutes, buy a brand new Mercedes or a Ford Escort, and I can go in your hospital and go into emergency room all day long, and the only thing I can't get in your city is a cleaning for five days. It's unexcusable, it's unacceptable, and go back to the restaurants and hotels. Do restaurants, hotels, and airlines have cancellation, no-shows, and broken appointments? No. Restaurants know that everybody wants to eat from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. 
So they got extra tables. But from 9 a.m. to 12, all their tables are empty. They don't run around and holler, oh, my God, cancellation, no show, reschedule. They're looking at the dollars collected for a day, not how many tables are filled. Lunch is swamped from 12 to 1. So what did Pizza Hut do? Pizza Hut was founded by Dan Carney, uh, also from Wichita, Kansas, went to the same church as he did. Dan Carney, why did he do the buffet? Because if you come into Pizza Hut at 12 o'clock, and they seat you, and they take your order, and they get you a Coke and a pizza, and they get all things. It takes them 55 minutes to flip a table. So lunch hour, every table does one person. So what do they do? They take the average bill of everybody that comes in there and eats, and say it comes to $3.95. So you just tell everybody, look, hey, buffet, all you can eat, $3.95. Why? Because when you come in, they seat you, you go to the buffet, and you eat, and you flip the table in 30 minutes. So by taking the average ticket price... And then just saying, hey, this is what you apes eat. Don't eat it all. Just everybody give me three ninety five each. They flip the tables twice at lunch. So that's like having twice as many tables by just having your fee structure different. But you either got to flip tables faster or you got to sit there and look at dollars collected for a day. And a hygienist on percentage who's paid 33% and she knows this, okay? It's the hourly hygienist who's into no-shows and cancellations and reschedules and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's all capacity design, you see it everywhere, multiple lanes at banks, bookstores, grocery stores, McDonald's, everybody knows capacity equals a wave. So get your map of your dental office and design this thing from the start. And uh, look at your flow plan. Another thing you can do is you can start looking through your operational logistics and finding out how can you facilitate more people through? You know, like I'll go into an office and a, uh, from an operational logistics point of view, the hygienist takes x-rays maybe on uh, bite wings almost on every uh, patient, yet the x-ray developer is uh, 50 steps away from the office machine clear in the back corner. And I'll sit there and I'm looking at a floor plan, I'll say, oh my God, you, you kill four minutes every cleaning walking all the way to their side of the office. When you're looking at a diagram of your office floor, like a basketball court, it's pretty easy during a team meeting to say, well, we keep running behind this and that, this and that. How could we increase the flow? And they'll come back and say, well, hell, why don't we put another developer right here? Because a lot of times I'll go to the developer and somebody's in the room and I gotta wait and then I gotta come back and it makes me run behind. And another thing you do is when you go have a wave of people come to the grocery store, the checker doesn't run around the 60,000 square foot grocery store looking for other checkers. He goes to a $12 PA system and says, I need all checkers to the front, all checkers to the front. We got a big wave of apes coming in the front door. You need light systems. We got those communication light systems. We have office-wide paging. Um, why, you know, I just push the button and says, I need examiner room two. It beats um, in about every eight operatories, doctor's office, front office, back office. I mean, I think we have these beepers. I think we must have like eight. I think we have 23 computers and 23 beeper systems. And another one we have is we have an office-wide paging where um, sometimes they're not coming or whatever. You know, who knows what's going on? Let's go to the pager. Uh, I need examiner room two, examiner room two. Or uh, um, could Dr. Summers please come to room two, whatever. But shave off minutes hundreds of different ways, getting developers closer, getting paging systems. I don't care if you need a phone and a computer terminal, but get what you need to increase your speed, your turnover, not running behind, and raise your fee till you always have capacity. No one in free enterprise ever hits 100%, because the minute you hit 100%, you're running off your customers, and you've gone from profitability mode to deflationary mode. You're crust to the mountain, and you're back on your way down, and you're feeding the alligators of competition across the street. Think about all this stuff, and uh, thanks again for another wonderful day.